how to make smarter uh, shopping choices and eating choices. Um, so yeah, the life of the field has really been quite exciting. We've had a lot of corporate groups come on board, Diabetes Australia, YMCA, lots of other organisations, Healthy Eating Victoria. Um, so we're very excited about what the film might be able to achieve and um, so far it seems to be heading in the right direction. Just, yeah, I'd just like to congratulate Dan on the film. I thought it was the first time I've seen this tonight. I thought it was absolutely sensational. I thought he, he in a very entertaining way, broadcast the message of real food. And, uh, and that's sort of what it's all about for me. My, the reason I'm um, on the panel, um, I'm a radiologist, a medical specialist, but um, two and a half years ago, I um, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, which is the autoimmune type of diabetes. And back on. Um, I followed standard advice for a couple of months and found it very difficult to control my blood sugars. Um, and then uh, after a lot of reading, I read countless uh, medical journal articles and lots and lots of books and I adapted, changed my diet to a uh, diet which is much lower in carbohydrates and higher in healthy fats. And I was able to reduce my insulin dose by half, get my uh, A1C into the normal range and I've maintained it in the normal range for two years now. And I was having one hypoglycemic episode a week and I would now have a, which is where you go low in blood sugar, and I'd now have a hypoglycemic episode maybe every three months or four months, very, very rarely. And when I do it, just sort of drifts very low, uh, very slowly, and it's very easy to correct. So um, that's, that's probably why I've been asked to, to speak. I um, was asked to go down to the um, diabetes conference, and I took part in a, a debate, and uh, Prof Tim Noakes, I don't know if anyone, if you know him, but he's more with listening to, is also on my team, and um, we debated that carbohydrates um, were the villain, uh, dietary villain in the management of diabetes. Hi everyone, now my name is Christine Croner and I'm a nutritionist and I wrote the books called The Fat Revolution, Fat Revolution Cookbook. And basically the reason uh, I started writing those books is because I tried the healthy diet. I did the healthy diet for a long time, I was low fat vegetarian. Um, and I even didn't have a lot of desserts, etc, etc, but I became insulin resistant. I was overweight uh, when I was in my early 20s. I did all the right things and ended up in a real mess. I ended up with chronic fatigue. I ended up with all kinds of hormonal issues, all kinds of stuff. And so what I figured out in the long run was that everything we'd been told about diet was wrong. And it was a shock to me. It was, you know, I was absolutely... I was actually angry when I first found out because I'd been trying to do all the right things and ended up much worse off than other people who were eating whatever they want. So the, the thing that I love about this film is that you did it with healthy foods, that you didn't just eat junk food because that's what a lot of people try and you know, sell, that it's just the sugar in, in the junk foods, etc. But you did it with healthy foods. And healthy foods, healthy eating, is making us sick. It's making us diabetic. It's making us obese. It's giving us chronic fatigue. It's giving us autoimmune conditions. Basically, we have gone down this road uh, and fat got vilified. Fat was always the culprit, but it was never the fat. It was always this sugar that we introduced into our diet. And basically between 1890 and 1920, sugar consumption doubled and it just kept going. And so now we've, we've accepted it as normal, but it's not normal at all. And it's really destroying our health. I just wanted to give a, a few stats um, just uh, before we open it up to discussion from the floor. Um, two, in, two in three Australians are overweight, and so with a BMI of uh, 25. One in three Australians are obese with a BMI of over 30. One in four of our children are overweight. And predicted by the year 2025, two in three adult Australians will have type 2 diabetes. Now this is a major global epidemic that 
um, we need to address uh, sooner than later. And um, I don't think we can let uh, another day go by, particularly as medical practitioners and working in a hospital um, where we don't uh, uh, address these issues with our patients. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, my enthusiasm for this topic um, arose out of my patients not receiving the education from their um, their usual resources, so primarily their, their local medical doctors. And I felt that for me to stand by and not at least try to educate them or educate their own doctors about this issue was a form of, of malpractice in, 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 in essence. And, uh, at some at some points, I have received some um, unhappy uh, letters back from uh, from patient doctors saying, you know, what would you know? You're a neurosurgeon. Um, just let me look after their their medi other medical problems. I send them to you because they've got uh, a disc prolapse or something. But my response to that is that you know, I I can't put this patient who's 130 kilograms on my operating table. I can't do the operation that they need. Um, until we improve their nutrition and, um, and restore their metabolic health and, and reverse their metabolic syndrome. So this is a bit of a survey. I just want to know how many people in the audience here are, uh, are doctors, medical doctors? Okay, fantastic. And how, how many people um, are aware of the condition of metabolic syndrome? So that's not a very big number. And, and uh, metabolic syndrome affects one in four uh, human beings on the planet. That's a pretty staggering statistic um, with you know, half of the theatre or a quarter of the theatre um, being medical practitioners that may not have a clear understanding of metabolic syndrome uh, for it to affect one in four human beings on this planet. Uh, and, and some of that data is actually a few years old. Um, so just food for thought there. So um, I might just uh, allow anyone and everyone to um, just raise your, raise your hand if you'd uh, like to ask a question. And I'm sure you've got a lot of questions for the start of the show, uh, Mr. Gannon over there. So um, just pop your hand up and, and we'll try to address you. Yep, and maybe stand up as well. I'm just curious if you've had any death threats from <laughs> um, not quite as uh, as severe as a death threat, but um, look, I I think we probably received less opposition than I I thought we would. I got a lot of sort of um, social media abuse making the film, a lot of trolls and vitriolic comments that were flying my way, but they sort of seemed to dissipate once the film came out. Uh, we've been asked to screen the film at five very, very large companies that rely on sugar. Um, now again, that's either to, um, they've asked me for like a private screening and Q&A afterwards, um, either to assassinate me in front of their staff, <laughs> or um, I think they know that this message is coming. Um, it's capitalism, they want to survive, they want to give the consumer what it wants, and we're already seeing low sugar products starting to come out. Coke Life released their whiz -bang new version last week, still with 10 teaspoons of sugar in a 600 ml bottle. Um, up and go, I've just done a low sugar variety. So I guess the question is what are they replacing the sugar with in some of these products? But a lot of them have thought the film would be more dogmatic than it is. I think they thought it was going to be like a Michael Moore film and very sort of uh, anti-sugar. And we're, we're sort of not trying to say that. We're just trying to get people to be more aware of what they're having. So I think that's kind of protected us in a little, a little way. But we do open the film in America in July. So if I'm ever going to cop a death threat, I reckon it might be the States. So if I disappear, you know what's happened. Um, the, the I Quit Sugar movement has been quite prominent on social media, um, but reading some of the recipes, a lot of the recipes replace your normal sugar with like rice malt syrup or coconut sugar or agave. And I saw a few of those images on the show, but to me, I feel like those replacements have the same effect as a spike. What do you, what's your opinion on the I Quit Sugar kind of movement and what would you recommend? Uh, so, 
what we were targeting in the books that I wrote, and, and I think what Damon was targeting in the film is fructose, which is the fructose half of sugar. So cane sugar, the white stuff that we know of, the sugar, sucrose, is half glucose, half fructose. Um, so sometimes the replacements for sugar um, aren't replacements for sugar in that they have exactly the same amount of fructose or more. Uh, so honey, for example, has exactly the same amount of fructose as sugar. Coconut sugar does too. Um, maple syrup has more. Agave syrup is 90% fructose. So um, those are not replacements for sugar. They're just other names for sugar, usually much more expensive names for sugar. Um, uh, some replacements for sugar remove the fructose. So things like rice malt syrup, um, which tastes and looks and behaves like honey, um, is just the glucose half of sugar. And so you're eliminating the part of sugar which is the problem, the part that causes the metabolic problems that happen in Damon, the part that causes the fatty liver disease. Um, and the only other one that removes the fructose half um, is dextrose, or which is just another name for glucose. Um, so as long as what you're replacing sugar with does not include the fructose that is causing the damage, then you should be fine. Rice malt syrup is fine, but maple syrup isn't. It gets about being kind to yourself. If you're just going to have a little bit in a treat every now and again, it's fine, you know. I, I might, um, I've got a slightly different opinion to that. Um, it, it depends, is, would be my response to that. So if you have any level of insulin resistance, um, or for me, type 1 diabetes where I'm insulin, I don't, like, I don't produce my insulin, then I, I can't have those glucose containing products. So. Um, that's why I would actually have a very low carbohydrate diet, um, as it's, so I can't have those products either. And if you have any level of insulin resistance in the metabolic syndrome, then they will still spike your insulin. And if you're insulin resistant, then that insulin will stay high for a prolonged period of time. And that pr prolonged high insulin level will mean that you lose your metabolic flexibility to burn fat. Um, so a normal person's insulin response will spike and then go low as that, sugar, as that blood sugar normalises. But with someone with the metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, it will go high and it will stay high and that limits their metabolic flexibility so they couldn't have those products. Well, stevia is actually not an actual sugar. So it doesn't have the fructose component, it also doesn't act like a glucose. So if we're addicted to sugar, then we have to keep in mind that any sort of sugars that we're taking in, things that taste sweet, are going to keep us wanting that sugar. But it doesn't have the response in the body, so it doesn't have the fructose or the glucose. So stevia is my favourite sweetener for that purpose. Again, even with the the glucose containing sweeteners, I like to keep those reduced as well because just like Dr. Stapleton was saying, um, some people do have a problem with too much glucose. We can overdo the glucose in my opinion and especially when we're insulin resistant, for example, we react completely differently to carbohydrates than a person who's not insulin resistant. And for example, someone who's insulin resistant who for example, has a complex carbohydrate like lentils or sweet potato, uh, they'll have a small spike in glucose. Someone who's insulin resistant can eat this very same thing and have a huge spike in glucose. So I think it's really important to understand the state of our health as far as how much sugar we can actually take in, whether it's natural or otherwise. So there's other things, I think you mentioned xylitol. Um, it's so some people who are low carb, high fat, for example, do use xylitol. I prefer not to use xylitol just because it can cause digestive upset, etc., etc. And I think anything that upsets our digestion is not good for our health. So you can get some naturally de derived versions of xylitol, um, but most are manufactured. So again, I kind of try to go towards stevia as my preferred sweetener. Do they 
today they be a charge or well, we probably have a few different opinions on the panel about artificial sweeteners. My personal opinion is not to touch them because they are a chemical. There, there are studies to show that they do cause weight gain for various reasons. Uh, and also there's a doctor in Brisbane who specialises in MS. And he says that over 70% of the patients who are referred to him for MS symptoms do not have MS at all, they have aspartame poisoning. So to me it's a scary product and I, I wouldn't want anything in my body like that, but there may be some other opinions on the panel. Um, I, I don't have them because I just, I don't, I just eat real food and so um, I, don't eat, I don't have any sweeteners and I've lost the taste for it. And it is amazing how you do lose the taste for it. And then when you taste, like, I don't have much milk, but even, even milk tastes sweet to me now. It just, your taste buds totally change. And, and if I was to have something that you would regard as sweet, it would be just ridiculously sweet for me. I, just... I think, again, it comes back to what we were talking about before of context. You know, if you have an incredibly high sugar diet, then... You know, maybe these types of drinks, I think David describes them as almost methadone for sugar addicts. You know, sometimes it can help you come down. Um, I personally wouldn't recommend them. I don't think there's anything favourable about them. But again, we're having this discussion even with the Aboriginal community. We can't just walk in and rip out all their soft drinks. How do we do it in a way that sort of is a transitional phase? So uh, again, it depends where you're at. Um, but I certainly wouldn't recommend having them. And again, it keeps that sense of sweetness alive. And we're trying to step right away from that. And I was someone that had two vanilla Cokes a day uh, five years ago, and now I find a banana almost too sweet. I can taste the sweetness in a carrot and other vegetables, and I never thought that would be possible. Did you want me to describe? Yeah, it's in the film. Did you it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a cluster of. What is metabolic syndrome? Yeah, so it's a cluster of um, elevated fasting blood glucose, truncal obesity. So that's sort of typical, sort of, so like a beer gut, but yeah, so like a, a increased waist circumference, um, high 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 blood pressure, um, and an atherogenic profile on your blood lipids. So the profile in your blood lipids is elevated triglycerides with a low HDL. And interestingly, that LDL is not necessarily elevated. So it's the high triglycerides and the low HDL, which, which characterises the pattern. And so those things, that atherogenic pattern of dyslipidemia, high blood pressure, high fasting glucose, and that truncal obesity, so that typical male sort of middle-aged spread, that is the picture of metabolic syndrome. And underlying metabolic syndrome, just like Gerald Raven has published in Diabetes Care, is insulin resistance. So the underlying condition of metabolic syndrome is insulin resistance and the hyperinsulinemia that results from a high carbohydrate diet. And so in order to correct that, the thing to do is to take out the high carbohydrate diet to correct, to get the insulin levels to lower and, and then, every, and then it, re, it resolves. And, and fatty liver goes with that as well. Okay. The other simple answer is if you walk towards the wall and your tummy hits the wall before your toes, the scientific answer that Troy and Rabbit lost out notice that cholesterol, cholesterol <coughs> level, was not in that definition at all. So the, your blood cholesterol, which we all fastidiously look at and the, the, the patients tell us, you know, I've got to control my cholesterol, my cholesterol. LDL, but the triglycerides and HDL. So it's that it's that pattern, which is atherogenic dyslipidemia. Um, there's another great stat where um, I think 20% of obese people are metabolically healthy, and 40% of seemingly healthy skinny people are metabolically unhealthy. So you might get the fat on the inside again, which is what happened to me. It might not appear like you're big and obese, but there's all sorts of complications going on inside. versus the apple-shaped apple body habitus. And, and that difference um, occurs because of insulin resistance. 
the, the peripheral fat has a much greater